Hey, good evening, everybody. You okay? Oh, that was awesome. Hey, let's stand together. My name is Tyler. So glad that you're here tonight. If you're new with us, welcome. We're just going to begin just singing. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice. Your people cry out, Lord, you from the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh.
beautiful thing just to sing to God and last week if you were here Craig introduced this song to us it's called here is love it's an old hymn and we just wanted a chance to sing these truths to God and respond to him so let's sing and here is love vast as the ocean loving kindness as a flood and when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood and who his love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise and he can never be forgotten through our hell eternal day On the mount and on 
the mouths of crucifixion Fountains all deep and deep and wide And through the flood gates of God's mercy Flow the vast and gracious tide And grace and love like mighty rivers Lord and sets you from above Heaven's peace and perfect justice Kissed a guilty world of love Oh, you've come, God Let me all your love And let me all your love accepting Love you ever all my days And let me seek your kingdom only And my life be to your praise And you alone will be my glory Nothing in this world I see And you have cleansed and sanctify me You alone have set me free I'm free, God He has set us free And His love casts out all fear So let's just respond and sing to heaven No mountain high And no mountain high No valley low no river wide can separate us No fear in life, no fear in death No fear in love, His love is perfect No mountain high, no valley low No river wide will separate us No fear in will not remember and who can cease to sing his praise and he can never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal day So we just bless the Lord tonight. Let's sing it together. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, and worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy. It's a new day, and the sun comes up, it's a new day, darling, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass, and whatever lasts before me, God, let me be singing when the evening comes. Let's sing it out together. Bless the Lord. And bless the Lord. Let 
great and your heart is kind and for all your goodness I'll keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to to sing and just a chance to be together. Let's pray. God, tonight we tell you that you are good. We just return that back, God, in some way to bless your name. And God, as we just sung, there's so many reasons for us to sing. And so I thank you, God, that you hear our hearts. Not only the words that we uh, seeing in these truths, but God, you hear where our hearts come from and how you stir us. And so God, I thank you for being here among us. And I just ask that you not take your Holy Spirit from us. And so God, just in this moment, as we just stop and just reflect on you, I pray that you would come close. And we tell you today, God, that we need you and long for your presence. For in your presence, we know that things change. And so may change come from you, Jesus. And as we just continue to worship and give, I pray you bless it. We would do it with joyful hearts out of obedience. 
God, I thank you for this time and place and getting to worship you and bless us now as we just hear from your word and continue to speak. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. You can have a seat. My precious seven o'clock. Um, you know, I, I enjoy talking with everybody, but you're my people. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward tonight I, to talking with you and kind of telling this story, this uh, journey God's taken us on that's leading us to San Francisco. And I've, I've told every, I'm, I'm, every hour I've been slightly afraid of ending up in a ball of uh, snot and tears on the floor. Um, as we get closer and as reality sets in, you know, there is sadness that sets in um, and some pain in this process. Um, my daughter, Frances, she's um, kind of our creative thinker. She's the one who would do math homework sheets and put the answers all over the sheet. She, she didn't understand the answer for a math problem needs to be in the space next to the problem. You know, why can't it be in the border? It looks prettier there. You know, she's that kind. And she, uh, I, I'm a real feelings guy, so I'm constantly badgering my kids. You know, how you doing? How you feeling? Constantly trying to draw, draw feelings out of my kids. Right, Margaret? Yeah, <laughs> they, it drives them crazy. But I'm like, I want to know how you're doing. So I asked Francis a long time ago as we were beginning this process, I said, uh, well, how do you feel about it? Are you nervous? Are you excited? And she said, well, actually, I'm, I'm a little bit nervited. <laughs> I'm nervous and I'm excited. So as, as reality has been hitting and as, you know, when, when you make a move like this, it's, it sounds really cool and then and then reality hits and, and things start leaving your house and you start contemplating leaving friends and you sell your house and, and, and uh, there was a little sadness or a story I perceived, so I dig a little deeper. How are you feeling today now? Are you sad and are you excited? Are you nervous? And she goes, well, now I'm a little sad-sided. I'm excited and sad. And it was interesting. It's, it's been neat to sort of walk with my family through this because Kids don't understand that, you know, they don't always understand crying, you know, you cry when bad things happen and, and why are we crying and why are we sad and we don't like this way this feels and it was neat to just, just share with them what I really believe in and that's that it would be a tragedy if we were leaving here and we weren't sad. It would be a tragedy to move from some place like this to another area where God was calling you and, and have no feelings in your heart, for, to not have been touched in a way that, that generates some pain that separation and just just sharing with them I think it, it, we have a huge blessing in what we have here that God is calling us from and, and how and the sadness that we're experiencing is a sign of how precious this has been to us I've, I'm grateful to um, Patrick for preaching directly to me over the last six weeks through this fear series I am if I have one defining characteristic of my life the one thing about me that I think of when I think of me at age three and on through my life, it's fear. I was just a scared kid. I was scared of everything. I didn't do anything without some fear. And I, I'm not a risk taker by nature. And I, I, don't, I don't jump at these opportunities. You know, I don't, I don't get a rush of adrenaline. I don't like adrenaline. But it's been so cool in this series, as we, as I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this journey, but just, just getting into it, just, just sharing where we've been. Um, God has been dealing with my fear through Patrick's sermons and, and even through my kids and, and, and watching them face their fears. You know, you know, watching Frances, you know, in her own way, but watching Margaret, and Margaret's a lot like me, and and. Gosh, I know that she's scared. But I'm watching her cling to her faith and cling to her trust that the Lord is moving us there and the Lord will take care of us. And it's been beautiful for me to watch. Watch that in a 12-year-old. I've learned a lot about fear from my son. Peter, he's taken diving and he gets up on that three meter. And you may not think that's very high, but just get up there sometime and stand on there backwards and, and just fall. And I watch him and I can see the fear on his face. And I realize, you know, I... I couldn't, I'm not proud of him because he's fearless and I'm not proud of him because he gets up there and takes a risk. He's never been that kid. He's never been the little boy that, that does stupid things. He's thoughtful. He's careful. 
And I watch him get up there and I see the fear, but then I see him take that deep breath and do the dive. And what makes me more proud of him is not his fearlessness. It's the fact that in the face of his fear, he's not crippled. And he pushes through it because he's thinking and he's going, I know what I know what I know. And for us, for me in this process, dealing with my fear and everything that's been speaking into that, I I expressed some fear one day and Patrick reminded me that when we opened this building, I don't remember what year that was, 03 or 04, we used to have a Wednesday night Bible study and I had, I was privileged to be the first Wednesday night Bible study teacher right down here, sit on the floor for three weeks. I taught through Joshua and in the book of Joshua, in the very first chapter, Joshua was about to take the people of Israel over across the Jordan into the promised land. And the, the waters are at flood stage. He has to step into them before they open. There's not a clear path for him. And then he knows that once he gets to the other side, it's not a hammock and milk and honey. It's fighting for what God has promised him. And he's afraid. And we know he's afraid because God has to comfort him and challenge him and encourage him three times. He says, be strong and courageous. Three times. He says, be strong and courageous. Remember my promises. Be strong and courageous. Follow my word. Be strong and courageous for I am with you wherever you go. And I'm not naturally fearless. I'm full of fear. And I'm okay with that. Because the Lord is helping me press through that. Remembering his promises to me. Remembering the faithfulness of his word. And knowing that he's going to go with us wherever he calls us to go. So Patrick asked me to share this story. And I'm, I'm glad to do it. You know, when I think about things, I, I have a real bad head. You know, like in my head, things go, go bad fast. But when I talk about it, uh, it's also real and exciting. And so I'm excited to talk with you guys tonight. Let me pray and let's jump in. God, thank you for this group of people. Thank you for this faithful seven o'clock crowd that has just been my joy to both do church with and to speak to over the years. And um, I just, I pray you'd bless us tonight as we share this story of, of you working in a heart and in a family's heart and in the hearts of two churches. God, I pray you'd be glorified by this testimony, sort of light on theology, heavy on testimony, I pray that in that testimony, God, this would be about you. We love you and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So in 2008, summer of 2008, Patrick and I went to the Southern Baptist Convention annual meeting. And if you've ever been to one of those, they are a rip-roaring good time. (laughs) And they're full of incredible inspirational teaching. Not really. And honestly, we didn't spend a lot of time listening to the teaching, but we happened to be in the auditorium when Jeff Orge, who's the president of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary, which is right outside the city of San Francisco, we were, we were there when he began speaking and giving his seminary report. And in his talk, he showed slides, and they were pictures of things almost that looked like foreign countries. And then he said, these are within walking distance of our seminary. And he said, we at Golden Gate realize that we don't have an option of learning how to engage culture. We must engage culture. We cannot raise up pastors who who still live in some sort of Christian culture bubble. We have to teach our people how to engage the world that's right outside our doors. And what he spoke that morning resonated with Patrick and me It was inspiring. It was probably the most inspirational talk of the whole week. It was motivating. We as a church were were really trying to figure out what we were going to do in North America. And we we had a desire to get into a city. And when he talked about that, we thought we need to go talk to him. We want to work in San Francisco. And so we made a beeline for his booth. We told him that we were interested in doing something with San Francisco. And he said, if you want to do something in San Francisco, you need to contact First Baptist Church of San Francisco. And that is how Bruce Lowe... Mike Elkins and I ended up the following October, 2008, visiting First Baptist Church of San Francisco for the first time. It was really my first time to spend any time in the city. I had been there briefly once before, just in and out um, when I was on a business trip in California. And it was my first time to be there and just to soak it all up. And I was immediately captivated by that city. It was unique and it was vibrant and it was creative and it was diverse 
and it just resonated with my heart. I, mean, I was just filled with something. And it was gritty too, you know. It's not, it's not all Victorian buildings. You know, there's a lot of home, homeless people there everywhere. And it is spiritually very dark. But even that grittiness didn't phase my attraction to it. I saw nothing but beauty when I looked at that place. Beautiful buildings, beautiful people. So our host was taking us around the city and it was very clear very early that there was not much of an evangelical influence in that city at all. I mean, the church we were visiting, First Baptist was trying to do some things, but, but as a whole, you could just tell the church was not relevant in that place. The few churches that we saw that were living weren't doing anything. Many of them were dying or close to death or had already died. We saw lots of uh, beautiful old church buildings that had been turned into community centers or um, nonprofits or even bars. Apparently it's fun to drink in an old church. But it was sad. And the reports we got were that the church was on a, what little bit was left was just dying and, and a slow death. But what we did see was at the, the churches that were there, um, some, of the, some of the mainline churches that were there, um, they were still there, they were still operating, but they had really ceased to be a church. They were more of a social center. Um, and, and primarily their emphasis was on reaching San Francisco's large homeless population and not reaching them, but feeding them and taking care of their physical needs. Um, San Francisco, its churches, its nonprofits obviously care deeply about the homeless people there. Uh, You can get three meals a day, seven days a week. You you might be homeless, but you shouldn't starve. And it was neat to see that care. It was neat to see um, uh, almost a respect that, that the city treated the homeless people with. But the homeless people weren't what captivated me on that first trip. What captivated me were the other people the self-sufficient people of that city, the people that owned the amazing businesses that we saw and the restaurants and the creative shops. One man I had breakfast with in one of my visits to San Francisco told me that San Francisco is the most entrepreneurial city in the world. They don't like chain stores. They don't like uh, uh, big box stores. Um, They're unique and they're individual. Amazing creativity and innovation and finance have, have either been birthed in San Francisco or matured there or in the, in the greater Bay Area. If you think about things like um, Facebook and Twitter and Apple and Craigslist, even the Gap was started in San Francisco. And I asked our host, I said, what is the church? What is the Christian community? I see what they're doing with the homeless people, but what is the church doing to reach all those other people? The tech people and the finance people and the business owners. What, what are y'all, what, what's happening here that's attempting to, to reach them? And he told me, and he said, of course, of course, they at First Baptist, they were trying some things at that stage. Um, he said, but generally the evangelical community in San Francisco does not perceive that those people need anything from the church. And like it was yesterday, I can remember I can remember the sense of God speaking mission into my heart. And I said, what, what? What do you mean? They need Jesus and and we know Jesus. And I thought about Jesus, he came to reach the culture. He came to reach the world. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He didn't come for the righteous. He came for sinners. And I was sitting in a beautiful city full of, of exactly who Jesus came for. And it felt like the church had given up on them. It hit me as I thought through this, and this was a pivotal time in me, just in me personally, and and in in how I looked at, at the evangelical church and our evangelical purpose. But I realized that I think the church as a whole, us included, the whole church, Church Universal, the the Christian church, especially the West. Actually, I'm going to limit it to the West. I think we have a difficult time reaching the culture who does not need anything physical from us. 
It's easy to minister to the poor, right? Because the poor need our food and our water and our shelter and our resources. And if we offer it, they will come to us because we have something physical that they need. In some uh, smaller communities um, where, where there's not anything else to do, there's no culture, there's no entertainment. People might go to the church for something to do. There's an entertainment value for some places. Um, in the Christian subculture, which is how I, I kind of view most of the South, Christianity has its own culture apart from individual hearts. And in the Christian subculture, the church is often a place of society. It's where you go when you move to a town to meet people, to get connected. It's a place of networking. It's a place of contacts. I remember as a young professional right out of law school, almost everybody I told me said the key to, to building your business is get involved in a church. It's where you meet people. But in San Francisco, and probably in New York, in Toronto, and Paris, and London, people don't need the church for those things because they can find those things in other places, in other places that are probably better at them. And instead of figuring out how to share Jesus with these people that, that weren't attracted by us, I felt like we had just um, given up on them and shut the door on them. Uh, one of my favorite passages about the ministry and mission of Jesus is found in Luke 4. And I kept thinking about that. It's where Jesus says that he is the fulfillment of, of a prophecy of Isaiah. Where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To give sight to the blind. To set captives free. And to, to put at liberty those who are oppressed. And I think sometimes we think about those in real physical terms. But I think Jesus was talking primarily about spiritual things. If it was physical, he would have said he sent me to feed the poor. But he says he taught, sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. I believe he's primarily talking about the spiritually poor and the spiritually blind and the spiritually captive and the spiritually oppressed. And when he did ministry on the earth, they, he, he ministered to lots of people who on the surface looked in the many different ways. But it was like he could always see beneath the surface to see their blindness and their poverty and their captivity and their oppression. And I stood in this beautiful city full of beautiful people and vibrant businesses on the outside. But it seemed as, a, as I looked in the eyes of people I met on the sidewalk, I, went, I remember going running in, in this neighborhood one day and seeing people's faces. And it was like God just gave me glimpses of their poverty and their blindness and their captivity and their oppression. And I just wondered why in the world are we not fighting with all of our being to be Jesus in a place like this? preaching and healing and seeing people set free in Christ. This, this trip in October of 2008, it was a pivotal time in the narrowing of my personal missional purpose. I, I've been privileged to teach Next Steps 3 and 4 over the last several years. I love those classes. And in Next Steps 3, we talk about how in the life of a Christ follower, as a Christ follower seeks the Lord and grows in maturity that the Lord will take them on a path of just continuing to narrow and define their missional purpose. Everyone in this room has a missional purpose. Some of them are big and dramatic. Some of them, your, 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 your missional purpose is right where you are sitting. But if we grow in intimacy with the Lord, he begins to show us, what, what do I have for you? And I, was, I struggled with that for several years because I was part of two mission trips from Stonegate to Sudan. And you know how you, I don't know if any of you do this, but sometimes I'll look at somebody else and I'll think, I want what they seem to have. I'm going to do what they did and I'm going to get what they have. And I, I saw people passionate about Africa, so I went ready. I went ready to be passionate about Africa too. And I loved what we did there. We, we helped build orphanages and it was great. And the people were amazing and the ministry was rich. But my heart was flat. It wasn't negative or it wasn't bad, but it wasn't like some of those other people. You know the people I'm talking about, the people that come back from Africa and they can't stop talking about Africa and they want to go back to Africa and they cry when they talk about Africa and it just oozes out of them this passion that God has given them for Africa to share the gospel there and to minister to people there. And I, and I wondered, is something wrong with me? Is my heart hard? Is my heart hard? Why do I not care about it like they seem to? But in 
October of 2008, I was standing outside the doors of First Baptist Church, and I was filled in my heart. And I realized I have found my Africa. This is who God has designed me and called me to reach. The self-sufficient culture makers, the creative culture makers of our world. We didn't get to meet many of the people of First Baptist in that first trip in October of 2008. We, the church was struggling at that time, and we really were just this, with this one guy, and he was really showing us the city. Um, and, and, you know, as a church, we, we believe, we say this all the time, the buildings are not the church. What right? You are the church. It's the people that, that make the church. And that's a huge um, uh, thing with me. I, I, I hate the thought of the church being identified with a building. But ironically, on that first visit, I was drawn to the building. There's a picture of it. It's going to come up, come up on the screen. This beautiful old building was built in 1910. It was built after the original building was destroyed in the earthquake in 1906. They had been downtown in the Chinatown area, what is now Chinatown. They moved out to the edge of town and built this building. This building that's perched on this amazing intersection of busy, thriving neighborhood, Octavia and Market Street. This building that has this kind of gold dome with a cross on top of it. The neighbors call it the candy dish. It has that very cool neon First Baptist sign. And I stood outside the doors of this church and, and I just can't tell you, this, this weekend for me was so rich in my soul. It was like God was just yelling into me. And I believed as I stood outside that he said, I am going to do something great out of this corner. This corner will be a place of influence in the city of San Francisco for the spread of the gospel and for the glory of God. And I knew as I stood there, I committed in my heart. I said, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure Stonegate stays connected with this place. And I'm going to stay connected with this place. I knew, I just knew that we were called to be a part of what God was going to do out of there. I just didn't know when and how it might end up looking. I want to tell you a little bit about the history of this church because I think it's really cool. I love history. If you don't love history, I think you'll think this is cool anyway. It was founded in... 1849, so if you watched the Super Bowl last week, you, you watched the San Francisco 49ers. 1849 is the height of the gold rush. It's when, it's when the city exploded from no people to thousands of people in search of the riches of the gold rush. 1849, this church was founded. 1849, California petitioned to become a state. 1850... California became a state. The church building, the first First Baptist Church building was the first Protestant church building in the state of California. The first recorded baptism by immersion came out of First Baptist Church. It's a, it's a beautiful story. The whole church walking down the street to San Francisco Bay, and it wasn't just First Baptist, other churches in the town that were gathering and missionaries who had come from different denominations, they all joined to go down to see this new believer baptized in San Francisco Bay. It was founded by a man who was sent from the American, American Baptist Home Mission Society. He was a pastor, a young pastor and his wife in New Jersey. He had, a, he had his own church in New Jersey. And this mission society came to him and said, would you plant a church in the barbaric land of San Francisco? And his family took a journey by ship that took several months way south and, and they had to get on horses at one point and went through Panama and um, went up the west coast. And, and San Francisco back then was described many, in many ways just like it's described today. I love this letter that I read. Okay, so, so the Baptist Home Mission Society asks and, and goes to this pastor and says, will you go and plant a church? Will you go to minister and be a missionary in San Francisco? And while, while this pastor, Osgood Wheeler, and his wife are praying through this call, the president of the mission society that has asked him to go sends him this letter. But do you know where you are going, my brother? I would rather go as a missionary to China than to San Francisco. 
Don't you stir a step, my brother, until you are prepared to go to the darkest spot on earth. And that missionary went and hit the ground running. And it is an amazing story of early San Francisco and and the people that he touched and the church that he founded there. But since 1849, this church has had seasons of plenty, seasons of growth, seasons of vibrancy, and seasons of very hard times. The famous preacher Dwight Moody preached there. His Bible with notes in it is still in the history room in the basement of the church. But then while we were there on a mission trip in 2009, we visited first in October of 08. We went back in June of 09 with the team. The pastor died while we were there. By our next visit a year later, there was no pastor. The entire staff had been let go except for one person and he was in his last month. And the church went through a terribly hard time when when it almost shut its doors. And my heart broke for it during that time. They kind of cut connection with us. There was really no, nobody to connect with us. And, and I was struggling with what I had believed. I heard God say on those, on those steps in front of that door. And I was pained and I was grieved. But then about a year and a half ago, we connected with the new pastor that they had brought on, a young man named Ryan Blackwell. Ryan was a graduate of Golden Gate Seminary. He had gone back to Northwest Arkansas to the megachurch where he had grown up, where he was on staff, uh, probably as 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 somebody who they would look to to be the future of that church. And they had just decided after going back to their home and to that big church to move back to San Francisco and take over leadership at First Baptist. And it was so cool as I sat there. I mean, I, I was impressed with him and I liked him and all that kind of stuff. But, but really, I thought, I've been so discouraged over the last years wondering. And I sat there with this man and I had a sense of gratitude to God. I was like, this is your man for this church. I'm so amazed that this church would even hire him. And I'm so amazed that he would even come back. The church was near death. And he's 26 at the time. And I thought, thank you, God. This is the man for this job. This is the man who's going to help carry this church to the place you have for it. And I was just reinvigorated with the desire to be a part of what was happening there. But while Patrick and I were sitting there talking to him, I don't know if Patrick remembers this. He was the only guy on staff. And he he talked with us a little bit about what he hoped to hire at some point in the future. And he said, I'd like to hire somebody who's older than me with some experience It needs to be somebody that's a pretty good generalist that can do lots of things, that has a pretty broad skill set. And I'm sitting there next to my boss and I'm thinking, he's describing me. And then I did this, (laughs) check that out. That will never happen. That could never happen. I don't want that to happen. That's not what I'm talking about, you know. But the more we built relationship with him over the next months, as Patrick and he and I all got reconnected and Stonegate and First Baptist got reconnected, eventually this whole thing sort of began forming. And about a a little over a year ago, so in, in the late fall of 2011, this opportunity actually presented itself to us for the first time. And Stephanie and I prayed through it and it was a arduous season of prayer for us and there were many things that seemed crazy about it but we just really believed that it was what God was calling us to do and and we went through a process with them but it didn't work out that time They, they didn't choose me and it was difficult I realized I haven't faced rejection in a long time I don't like it it was hard. We, we had sensed so strongly God calling us there and then this happened and it was very difficult and it really kind of kicked off a year that has had a lot of struggles in it. We have um, had idolatry in our lives exposed. We have had areas where we found security that weren't God exposed. And it's been hard and we've wondered sometimes what in the world is going on? Why? What a year. And then... Now, as we look back, we realize we were not ready to go a year ago. The things that he has taken us through, he needed to take us through. It's Hebrews 12 to me. It is 
the fatherly discipline of God in our lives. And, and God, when it talks about God's discipline in Hebrews 12, it's not like a spanking. It's not like punishment. It's discipline like training, like any good father will do to their son or their daughter. God has been disciplining us. He has been training us. He has been preparing us. He has been growing us and preparing us for this step. Hebrews 12 tells us that all discipline is painful for the moment but it always yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And so this opportunity presented itself again late in the fall of last year. And when it did, Stephanie and I knew that we had no choice but to submit to ourselves to it again. And here we are. One of the things we prayed that has been really sweet for us is that we prayed for great clarity for us, but we also prayed for great clarity for First Baptist, knowing what had happened last time. And we wanted them to, to know strongly that we were the ones who, who, they, who God was leading them to call. And, and God was so sweet in that, just a real decisiveness and unity from First Baptist. We also have seen God just preparing our kids. Our kids are not change people. They don't like it when you put a Christmas decoration in a new place. I mean, they don't like that. They like things as they are, they're tradition kids. And my greatest fear is, as Stephanie and I were processing this before we told them anything was that I would have to drag my kids there. And God was so faithful to prepare them and when we told them, they were excited. All three of them, uniformly excited. And there had been things just in the immediate weeks before that had just prepared their hearts to take a step in obedience even when it was scary. And it, it blessed Stephanie and me so much to see, even in their young faith, to see this sense of calling and this trusting in God. They're a little nervited. They're a little sad-sided. But I told Stephanie, it's either a miracle what has happened in our children or we didn't know them at all. And I'm so blessed by the way you and this church over the years have poured into them. As I know it is what they have learned here and what they have been exposed to here in the idea of missional living that has helped prepare them for this. A lot of people think we're doing this or they assume we're doing this and it has something to do with our, our history of doing ministry to people impacted by same-sex attraction and our cross-power ministries here and that's not what we're doing. You all are keeping cross-power ministries. Congratulations, it's yours. We are going there because God spoke to me and said, I want you to be a part of reaching this city, not one segment of this city, all of it. And that's what we believe God has called us to do. It's, in a, very, it's a very weird place to be in, I have to say though, to, to leave a thriving church, to leave a church where we have experienced incredible blessings in ministry, where so much wonderful stuff is going on, where we see 43 people go through a plastic hot tub at Elements on Wednesday night. It's hard sometimes to get my head around. I'm leaving this to go where there are a million challenges and a lot of unknowns. I'm leaving a place where I have never felt like a, a body had my back and loved me, like I felt from you, to a place that doesn't know me. And it's hard to even think about why we're doing it because God is at work here. And God has given us fruit from our ministry here. But last fall, God brought this to my mind. Last fall, I spoke and preached through John 15. You know, the passage about where, where the vine dresser prunes the fruitful branches off the vine so that they might bear more fruit. And even this had not even surfaced yet. And I had a sense that God was either going to prune us in a big way or was going to prune this church or maybe both. It says in there that when a branch bears fruit, it will be pruned so that it can bear more fruit. I believe this is a mutual pruning experience for us and for Stonegate. Maybe God is pruning us away from Stonegate so that Stonegate will bear more fruit. Or maybe God is pruning Stonegate away from us so that we will bear more fruit. Maybe both, but either way, it's an incredibly hopeful place to be, right? To know 
that it has been a mutually fruitful relationship and that for whatever reason there is a cut that is happening and to trust that God says, I care about each branch on that vine and I will not settle for the fruit that you're bearing when I can prune you back so that you can bear more or better. It is part of a plan that we cannot fully see but we can fully trust. And there is pain. Anytime something is cut, it's painful. But in that sermon last fall, I, I shared with you guys how I had always viewed pruning as sort of this very harsh thing. Like I envisioned like a big machete, just some guy just going through and just lopping stuff off. But that's not the picture of a vine dresser. In a vineyard, the vine dresser, he cares t- tenderly about each plant, about each branch. He doesn't just chop things off willy-nilly. He's intentional and he's purposeful. And he knows that when he does that, it's for the ultimate good of the fruit. And our vine dresser, our vine dresser, God, is the same way. He cares about each branch. And he's knelt gently in front and said, this needs to happen because this is what I have for this particular branch. And it may be painful. We may go through a winter season as we wait for the fruit to show itself. But it it may be painful, but it's fully intentional. And it's fully for our greatest joy. And it's fully for his greatest glory. I want to be real clear that I don't see this at all as about leaving for something better or for something more important. This is not a job promotion to me. I am not getting a better job, I promise you. It is even not about going to a more important mission field. If God has called you to stay here in Midland, this is the most important mission field for you. And if God calls us to go to San Francisco, that is the most important mission field for us. There's no mission field that's more important than any other. What this is about for us is following God's call when he said, follow me. As I've been reading through the New Testament and the gospels this year, I've, uh, I've thought, seen so many times how when Jesus called somebody to follow him, many times they said, I need to go take care of this first. I've got this important task that I'm doing, or these people are depending on me, or I've got people that need my help. And every time Jesus says, follow me now, I will take care of what is important to you. I will take care of the people that you're caring for. And that has blessed my soul. Because he's saying, I'm going to take care of everything you've been doing here. You know, Mike, you, you may be pretty good, but I can handle it without you. But you follow me now. There are parts of this move that are challenging for us and parts of this move that are scary for us. But as Stephanie and I have been processing this and processing this decision, we've realized that as scary as a move may be, the scariest thing we could do would be to stay here when God is calling us to go because that would be staying here in disobedience. And our disobedience would impact us and it would impact you. And he's called us to go and so we just are gonna go. The mission field of San Francisco is um, different but the same. You know, you think, sometimes you think about that as being way radically different and it is different in many ways but it's not totally different as the mission field right here. What is different is I think that lostness is a little more obvious there. There is no cultural Christianity. There's nobody that just goes to church for the sake of going to church. The people don't say I'm a Christian just because that's what everybody says or because they've grown up that way. People don't participate in Christian activities and Christian traditions. That stuff just isn't a part of the culture of San Francisco. Like it is in in Midland maybe or in, in, in generally in the South. There's a very clear line in San Francisco between Christians and non Christians. It's very obvious. San Francisco geographically is pretty small. It's 49 square miles, it's a seven mile square with 815,000 people in it. So if you do the math, that's a density of about 17,000 per square mile. It's the second most densely populated city in the country. 
And in that 815,000 people crammed into that little 49 square mile plot of land, 2% claim Christianity. Two. It is a mission field there. It's a mission field here too. It's almost harder here because a lot of people have a Christian label, but it's not so easy sometimes to figure out what's really going on in someone's soul. But our mission here, whether it's in in this place of a kind of a cultural Christianity that you don't always know, our mission there that's very dark is the same. We are to share the full gospel of Christ with the people of our community. We are to introduce people to Jesus. We are to walk with people as God transforms their life for eternity in an instant and as God transforms their life in the day by day of living abundant life. All of us are called, whether you live in a place like San Francisco or you live in Midland, we are all called to shine the light of the gospel in the world where God has placed us. It may be a little darker there, and you know if you're in a really dark place, light is is brighter and it's harsher, and it can be more glaring, it can be more pointed, it can be sharper. So for your, when we're shining the light of the gospel in a dark place, we have to be careful that we don't, we don't blind people with something that just pushes them further into the darkness. The gospel can hurt their eyes and we have to learn how to share it in the right way. But we still have to learn how to share it. We have to learn how to shine. A couple weeks ago when I was in San Francisco with my family and it was this old school process where I got there on a Tuesday and starting breakfast at Wednesday morning. We had meetings and meet and greets and teas and parties to meet people and then I preached on Sunday and they voted on me and that was it. It was like rush. It was, it was awful. But actually it turned out to be really cool and I really, really appreciated that opportunity to get to know those people. But I was anxious on that Wednesday morning. I knew what was coming, you know, assuming they voted us in. I knew what was about to happen. My kids were in San Francisco for the first time. There was a lot ahead of us and I was just feeling the weight of that and I I just opened my Bible where I was reading, um, just had been in in Matthew 5. I got in there when when Jay taught through it. I just thought, I'm going to read Matthew 5 again. And I was at this verse and if you have your Bibles and you want to open to this, this is a beautiful passage. But this was my reading on Wednesday morning as I prepared to go to my first meeting. It's verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I was so grateful to the Lord that that was my passage for that day. As I sat in a city physically on a hill, and as I thought about what God was calling us to, and I was reminded on the call on the life of every Christ follower, If I truly believe I have received life, then why in the world am I not proclaiming it as loudly and as effectively as I can? Why do we hide it? How can I hide it? Even and maybe especially in the face of potential persecution. I saw something in San Francisco as I sat in that hotel room. I saw that it is very naturally a city on a hill. There's a picture of it that's going to come on the screen. It's a beautiful city on a hill. And, and I didn't see all the electric light, but I envisioned it, the city on a hill with little pockets of glowing light. The few scattered believers in that city who were putting their lamp on a stand. And I didn't realize that I would be the privilege and the sweetness of speaking to them that Sunday, 275 of them coming to that church for encouragement as they go back out into the city week after week and shine the light of the gospel. And as I sat there in that room, I had maybe for the first time this great sense of privilege and favor that God might be moving my little family of light. We're we're so blessed, all three of our kids know the Lord. And I thought he's moving our family of light 
to this city on a hill. And I just started thinking what a privilege that my children will have to take their light and their little kid lampstands into the public school system of San Francisco. What a journey it will be as a family to figure out what it means to shine our light in a place so dark. I began to just picture what God might have in mind for San Francisco. I began to just think, what might he do to illuminate this whole city on a hill, not with electricity, but to fully illuminate it with the light of the gospel? I thought about how beautifully I, I think Stonegate has followed this passage. We are not a church and we are, you are not a people who seek to beam your light into the sensitive retinas of the lost and blind them with your holiness. You let your light shine in the way you live your lives, in the way you serve this community, in the way we teach and speak and the things we offer here at this church. And the community has seen Jesus in our lives and in our works. And 43 of them testified to their new life in Jesus here on Wednesday night. My challenge to you as my friends and my family is to keep shining your light in this very flat city that has not one hill. And my promise to you is that I'm going to take my light. And my family's going to take its light. And we are going to plant our lampstand in that city. And I want you to know how the light that, 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 that Christ planted in me so many years ago when I moved into a relationship with him has been so richly nurtured here. It has been purified here. It has been intensified here. And I think I can say that for my entire family. And we're gonna join the people of First Baptist Church, those 275 faithful and missional people. The church is growing. There's an excitement there. There's an energy there. It's, it's neat. I was a... a there, when we were there, I was talking with people and it was like the, the old movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. So in that movie, these aliens come to the Devil's Tower in Wyoming and Richard Dreyfus makes it out of mashed potatoes in that one scene. But all these people around the country have a visions of this mountain. They don't even know what it is and they start painting it and drawing it. And then they all are, they all are just drawn there for the uh, aliens to come. I felt like that except it wasn't aliens at First Baptist. I've met person after person who said, God just drew us here. We just sensed God was at work here. We just moved to San Francisco and changed our whole lives and bought, got new jobs because we felt like God was calling us to this place. We're going to be joining this community of people from all over the world who share a unified vision and a passion to reach that city with the gospel. We're going to join them and put our lights on the lampstand there. And this is what is so cool, and I'm so confident in this, and I believe this with all my heart, that there will come a time in the future where we, Stonegate and the Geeky family and First Baptist, we will come together and we will celebrate God's faithfulness in this season of pruning. I am so confident that God is going to show and experience in this place and in our lives and our family and in First Baptist, He is going to, he is going to bring out of this season fruit that we have never imagined. We thought everything was really cool and he's gonna show us I had so much more and here's what I had and we are gonna come together and we are gonna celebrate it. We are gonna come together in our common source of life because we never lose our connection to the vine. We come together in our common source of life. We've bear, bore, born new and rich and better fruit. And we will celebrate it because everything that God does in his fruit bearing is for the joy of all men and for the glory of God. I want my last word to you guys to be from the word. And as I was thinking about what I wanted to say, I, I just thought of how many times I'm, I've been struck by the personal intimacy of Paul's letters and how he writes to these churches and he has such an affection and so I read through several of Paul's letters and, and I read Philippians and I thought, this, this is my word that I wanna leave you with from you, from the word over you. It resonates with my heart for you, but, but I also want you to hear from God's word for you as I close this night out. This is in Philippians 1. 
I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day and thank you for this evening. And God, I thank you for what you are doing. I thank you for your love and attention and care to me and to my family, for your love and attention to care to Stonegate, for your love and attention and care to First Baptist San Francisco. God, I thank you that you love us so much that times you will cut us so that we can bear more fruit. Because you know that in bearing fruit for your kingdom, we find our greatest joy. And God, I truly believe that you have something um, amazing that you wanna do. God, I pray that you would give us faith and trust. God, if we go through a winter season, a dry season, a season that feels fruitless, God, I pray you would remind us all of your care for us and your love for us and the truth that when we bear fruit, you prune us so that we may bear more. God, I love these people. God, I pray you would bless them. God, I pray they would continue the work that you have them to do here in this community and around the world, the the worldwide influence of this body. God, I pray you would bless them. I pray you, as it says in Psalms, that you would confirm the work of their hands God, I pray that we would see more and more stories, more and more testimonies of the redeemed saying so and telling of your goodness that come out of this place. God, I love you and I I thank you for the privilege of being here today. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys. Have a great week.